I think we should start with a piece of cinema, with a clip um, from an earlier documentary that we have chosen, so you can get a, a brief introduction to Lucia Rijker. Tijdens het gevecht vecht ik acht rondes. Ik denk ik ben klaar. Nee, zegt de scheids, dan ga nu ook nog twee ronden. Nog twee ronden. Ik ga naar de commissioner, ik zeg ik heb acht rondes. Ah, ik zeg die, ik heb tien staan. Ga maar naar Joek. Zo. Ik had obstakel, na obstakel, na obstakel. Toen dacht ik zo. Ik laat me door niets en niemand verslaan. De beste twee rondes van het hele gevecht. I'm an academic. I derive meaning from sitting alone in my room, often feeling alone, trying to read books and write about them. You for a very long time were a boxer, which is a very different thing. Academia told me that there is no truth, that meaning can be found in books, but never really. What did boxing teach you? And I know this is a difficult start. But you have a minute? <laughs> God, what did boxing, I, I should say, what did combat sports teach me, because I started as a kickboxer. Um, wow, discipline, perseverance, self-knowledge, seeking my own limits, physically, spiritually, mentally. Um, I learned to connect with myself, express myself, I learned to be creative, I learned to be a trailblazer, believe in myself. As a child, early on already, I wanted to box when I was six years old, which was women's boxing didn't exist. Um, I had a sense of control, I could knock people out, so I didn't need to depend on referees or judges. So a sense of power, um, art, um, I've developed uh, a third level of listening, which is level one is me, me, me. Somebody shares, hey, I bought some new shoes. Oh yeah, I need some new shoes too. Oh yeah, my mom did. Yeah, oh yeah, I gotta do that too. Me, me, me. Everything relates to me, which is kind of a, an island. And then there's level two where you observe what's happening there. And level three is when you learn what's happening in the room, in between you and the group, or you and the other person. And in level three, I actually learned to read the minds of my opponents. So before they give the signal, or as they give the signal, the body still has to respond, I would hear the signal. So I would be just a little bit quicker than they were. So, uh, God, what didn't you teach me? It taught me everything in life. Uh, to stand up when you get knocked down, to endure, to roll with the punches. Um, to take personal responsibility, uh, cause and effect is very strict in boxing. If you party and drink alcohol and do drugs, you're going to get your ass kicked the next day. Um, in life, you can go through making causes for 30 years and then you get cancer and you're like, oh my god, how did that happen? But you might have been unaware all those times the causes mentally and physically that you put yourself through. Um, in boxing, it's, it's much stricter cause and effect. When you think negative, you get hit, boom, because you're not being present. If you have self-repeating thinking, you get hit too, or you might lose the fight just based on your inner dialogue. So it taught me self-mastery in a certain degree, and it taught me to reflect and observe my behavior, why do I do what I do, why does this girl want to box and get hit in the head and beat people in the head 
right? And from there, I wrote a lot of journals, and as I was writing, I got to know where that came from, partially my spirit, partially maybe some trauma as a child, maybe I wanted to prove something, and then I thought I created a career out of my teenage anger, and that was perfect. It worked for me. Yeah. So boxing is a way, maybe as a way of life, as a model of life. And of course it's nice if you say the teenage anger, because anger reminds me of, of, of lashing out, beating, making that outward movement, whereas as you said, the moment that you became established as a boxer, that you, you began to understand the trade, it is also about moving with the flow of others, so about a constant dialogue, as it were, with the world around you. Yeah, and, and uh, your opponent is an opportunity for you to practice something, to bring out something within you, right? Our environment is a reflection of us, so I learned not to always think at the opponent, but more at the opportunity. Um, also, anger, there are different forms of anger. Rage or physical violence is one form, but gossip and arrogance and superiority is, are also form of, forms of anger. Yeah. So, we all have all kinds of forms of anger um, that is uh, accepted by society when you have a physical violent type of form of anger and you channel it, you can create a career out of it. <laughs> I mean, there's other angry people that create a career out of being a critic. You know, when you're a writer, you can be very negative and if you win awards too. So there's ways to create value with anger, actually. Yeah. But what I like very much in the documentary Bittersweet that I saw is that you speak about boxing, both in the terms of you have to feel superior, whilst at the very same moment, it's not a distinct or different kind of category, it's at the very same moment you have to be very aware of the power of the other. So superiority, it seems, with the power and the dangers of the other go hand in hand. Would that be correct? I'm not sure if it's superiority. You just have to believe in your assets, your power, and your vision, and you have to push that into the reality. Because quant boxing is quantum physics, so... That means everybody has a chance, right? And the one that wants it the most will win the fight. What I love about boxing, for example, Mani Pacquiao fought, fought Marquez for the third time. I'm a, I'm a boxing fan. <laughs> so for, you know, I hope you're a little bit of a boxing fan. Anyway, I'll explain it. They fought for the third time. Marquez lost twice. One he got, once he got robbed, and the other time um, he, he did lose the fight. So he goes in for the third time, he gets paid something like six million dollars and his opponent gets paid 30 million. Enough reason to feel like a victim, right? Oh my god, it's because I'm Mexican, and uh, I'm not the favorite, it's his promoter, why would I do this again? They're gonna rob me anyway. He went in fully committed, this time I'm gonna beat him, right? And he goes in fully committed, he fights the fight, he gets dropped, uh, breaks his nose, you see him losing the fight, but he has hope and belief, and you see it. And his nose is bleeding, he backs up, and Pacquiao gets confidence and thinks he won the fight, and he's moving, showboating, bop, bop, and he launches in, which is exactly what Marquez worked on. He launches in, so Marquez pulls him in and steps back, and steps back, and he launches and loses his balance, and he hit him, bop, with one shot. Over. And I yell, yay! Because that's boxing. When you have belief and hope, no matter what your situation, you can still win the fight. And that's, I find that so beautiful. And it's in life. When you have hope and belief, you can turn things around. If you give up and you don't believe, you turn nothing around. So that that's what I love about boxing. Yeah. No matter how technically good you are, doesn't mean you're going to win the fight. It's the one that wants it the most that's yeah. going to win the fight. That is able to keep anticipating and moving on that flow of the... Sorry, this is ridiculous. I'm no, I'm the <laughs> looks all right. <laughs> you're all right. <laughs> um, who keeps anticipating and has the... I did it again. I don't know why I do that. Um, keeps anticipating and believing that he or she is in control of that, of that moment. Yeah, you might not be in control of this moment, but if you surrender to the moment and you keep having hope and faith 
when you stay in motion, you might create an opportunity until the last bell rings. You have a chance. Yeah. If you believe you have a chance. And this belief, because this is always what fascinates me about boxing. I saw that fight with Pacquiao, of course, one of the, the most famous pound to pound fighters perhaps in the world. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what always fascinates me is this, this unison, this movement with boxing between the mind and the body. There is not a mind and a body. There doesn't seem to be that distinction. They seem to merge effortlessly and they have to merge effortlessly at that moment. But belief is not so much a, a category just of the mind, but seems to become a category of the body. Yeah. yeah well, ideally, you want to merge mind, body and spirit. Boom. And then you float. And when I do that in my competitions, I would uh, hear the punches coming. And that's ideal. Yeah. It doesn't always happen, but that's where you work towards to really balance them all out. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, your body is embrained and your brain is embodied in the same way. I saw the same with Zinedine Zidane with his documentary that he says that he hears everything. He hears everything, the audience, people talking on the phone, and yet at the same time he's completely concentrated in that moment, allowing nothing to persevere. Yeah. And this reminds me also and comes, uh, brings us to the second video about Buddhism, perhaps, and about um, your practice of Buddhism. Could we see the second video? Is that okay? Don't let me wat ik het eigenlijk zelf uit moest zoeken, is eigenlijk mijn voordeel altijd geweest. En dat zag ik vroeger niet. Dan dacht ik dat het een nadeel was, maar het is mijn voordeel. En dat is ook weer zoals je als boeddhist kijkt naar dat een lotusbloem in de morde groeit. Dus hoe moeilijker de omstandigheden, hoe mooier je wordt. En dat kan ik wel zeggen van mezelf. Als ik ook foto's kijk van hoe boos ik was. 15 jaar geleden, hoe, hoe zacht ik nu ben. Ik had ook heel bitter kunnen zijn met alles wat ik meegemaakt heb. Maar ben ik gelukkig niet. Wat is boeddhism voor jou? <laughs> Sorry, again, this is probably a ridiculously big question. But if you were to, to explain it to the, to the people. To me, it's a way of living, a way of thinking, a way of interpreting life. Yeah. A way of living, of interpreting life. How does it express itself for you? How did you find it? How did it manifest itself? I found it uh, in a time in my life where I blamed my environment for my suffering. And I was stuck in it. I was stuck in in being a victim of my circumstances. And I continued to blame my circumstances because I didn't think I had a choice. I didn't even see the choice. I just thought, this person makes my life hell. And that's it. And that was the reality and the facts were, yes. And the moment I started chanting, I realized uh, my part in it, uh, my choice, uh, and my power in it. So once you realize choice, you have power. Um, and also, you know, when you when you give away your power, when you blame, you kind of give away your power. So the moment that you take personal responsibility that either you needed that experience or you put yourself there to learn something valuable that uh, you can use in life, that's a reframing that gives me power. Um, you can also frame it in a way that it took something from me and that it uh, scarred me and then it kind of weighs me down and what is it going to do for me? Nothing really. So that's what Buddhism taught me, to reframe, um, to learn to see life as it truly is, whatever that is, right? To just let go of beliefs that are disempowering me, that uh, don't support bringing out my fullest potential, to continue to move forward, to continue to open my heart. I, realized when my uh, my father passed away, I felt one eye shut, and when my mom passed away, the other eye shut on the inside, boom, boom, because I didn't understand death and, and the pain of it. And then once I learned to give it a place that life and death is like a saber apart, a crosswalk, right? You're there and you're not, you're there and you're not. Um, you have a body, you don't, you have a body, you don't. So, which is kind of rational, 
Right? And Buddhism says, suffer what there is to suffer and enjoy what there is to enjoy. So when you have a loss, you suffer. But if you don't understand death, you'll suffer more. It's with everything. If you don't really understand it, you suffer more. And a lot of suffering is made up. Right? We are allowed to complain and you know, imagine things that are not there, things that might happen, we worry about that'll never happen, which cause suffering. And that's what the mind does. So it helps me a little bit to put things in perspective. What's real? Yeah, but the facts are that boxing's dangerous. Getting in your car is dangerous too. And one of my friends, uh, Kuhn Verwey, one of his uh, skate mates fell and broke a vertebra and can't feel his legs. Skating is dangerous too. Every day I turn on the radio, car accidents happen. Driving a car is dangerous too. So it's just, how do you frame it? I want to go somewhere, so that's why I get in my car, or, oh my God, I hope it's not my turn today. You know, everything's reframing. It's a way for yourself to perhaps control, come to terms with the reality as it presents itself to you, and as a consequence, then find your own way within that reality that's constantly pushing itself up to you from all directions. Yeah, and actually, it's pretty arrogant to think that I know the future. Right? So if I freak out about something I fear in the future, it's pretty arrogant. Because yeah. I don't really know what's going to happen. <laughs> so if... Yes, no, yes. <laughs> I think they were laughing at my loud laugh. I, I have that a lot. Um, if I think of boxing as controlling controlling movement to an extent, then I think of Buddhism very much as controlling stillness of, of instilling for a moment. I'd like to say so. boxing is mastering movement and so is Buddhism. You okay. can't control such a yeah. tight mastering mastery is yeah. a word I think. So mastering yeah. those things. Or I know, I want to ask, yeah, yeah, I oh. want, really want to, I don't want to, I don't think we should stop. Oh, um, you want to ask a couple more minutes? Yeah, no, but I, I want oh. to ask at least some, uh, another oh. question maybe. Oh, okay. I mean, what I found really fascinating, again, bittersweet, you have to see it, I'm not going to say anything that happens, because it I plays, think you need it, to experience. It plays in Amersfoort and in the Bali in Amsterdam still. So the traveled yeah. theaters, so it's still in those two theaters. Yeah. Um, what I found really fascinating is at one point in the film, without giving away what happens, you try to go into a moment of chanting, and it seems to me as an outsider that it's difficult for you to get into that moment. Is that true? Do you sometimes find it difficult to find, to master that stillness? Well, the, the meaning of the, of the purpose of chanting is to face your life, right? So the moment you chant, you don't always want to face what's happening. Yeah. So sometimes it's hard. When you sit that, when I avoid chanting, I avoid my own life yeah. because I fear looking into it. Because once you know what's going on, that gives you responsibility to take action, right? Or maybe, which I do in the film, I release an emotion. I'm coming to terms with something that I'm really touched in my heart, and that I connect with my heart or my soul to another person's soul, and boom, the reality kicks in. Yeah. Before you leave us. Do you have one tip that you could give these guys? A tip? I think one tip that you know exactly what's good for you. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. <laughs> <laughs>